All right, looks like we've got a good audience here now, and uh, it's cranking, and let's go ahead and get started. So um, thanks for everybody in the chat pane confirming you can hear me okay. Let's see, let's, let, let's throw another chat pane question out there. Let us know maybe where you're, where you're signing in from, and um, let's do what's your favorite brand of quarantine, athleisure wear, sweatpants, PJs, whatever. I swear, I can't get online right now without getting blasted with ads for $80 sweatpants. So I'm not sure what that <laughs> says about me, but <laughs> that's, uh, that's what we're seeing right now. So, well, cool. Glad everyone could join us. Pumped for today's session. Um, those of you who this is your first time, I'm Mark Stoddard. I run sales and marketing here at Client Success. Also got Dave Blake, CEO of Client Success. Of course, we've got Michael on from ESG as our guest. Mike, Dave, what's up? How's everybody doing? Hey, doing great, Mark. Happy to join. Hey, everybody. Excited to be here again. Nice. We're all fired up. All right, let's see what we have in the chat pane. We've got um, got folks from Portugal wearing jeans. We've got Houston, pants at a time like this. Boston, beat up sweatpants. Some people are just going into the office, so they're just business as usual. Looks like it's all over the shop, so... Hey, what, are your guys favorite, what, what, what are your guys' advice? What's your favorite brands? I'm, I'm the Nike joggers. Uh, I, I bought a pair of those, like uh, trying to be a little bit hip. I'm, it doesn't work much for me, but, uh, but man, they're the best, best ones. Nike joggers, everybody. Nice. Yeah, so Mark, I've been overwhelmed by uh, the same Mac Weldon ads that you've probably received. <laughs> um, they, look, they look way too 20-something for me, so... Um, <laughs> I opted for a, uh, a pair of Lululemons instead, and they seem to do the trick. Nice. That'll do it. That'll do it. I still haven't pulled the trigger on anything. I'm just wearing the same stuff I had before, so I'm not sure if that does me any good or not. So, Well, cool. Um, so as we said in the last session, series is in full swing. Today, we've got Michael really pumped for his session. We'll talk through a lot of what we're going to do there. Next week, we've got Patrick from ProfitWell, Julie from Drift. Um, really good content. Um, if you want to go back and see any of the other sessions, I'm going to go, I'm going to start as of this afternoon, posting some recaps of the previous sessions. But if you want to go back and see any of the other ones in full context, you can just go to clientsuccess.com slash webinars. Um, go check them out. They will change your life. I'm not overselling at all. Um, but you see the recordings, really good stuff there. After we wrap up with Mike today, We'll go and we'll post the link there. And that being said, another thing, uh, love to get your feedback and thoughts on what's working, what's not working so far. This whole thing started a few weeks ago when we first went into quarantine and Dave and I started trying to bat around ideas of what we could do to help the market, help customer success in general. And we came up with this idea to do a two a week webinar and it's, taken on a life of its own. We've got a couple thousand people that have signed up for the series. Been really cool to see. So you're the ones that are tuning in. I guess tuning in is probably not the right word. You're not tuning, whatever. Um, doesn't really matter. I'm going to put a link to a Google form. If you could fill it out, would really appreciate it. Just love to get your thoughts on what would be more interesting. What would, what you'd love to see. So so yeah, if you could help with that, I'm gonna actually do that in the chat panel right now so I don't forget. And while I'm doing that, I think Dave wanted to share a few things. Dave, can you yeah. uh, hear us okay? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, glad to be here again with everybody. Thank you for joining in. Uh, we've, we love the, the long timers who have who've been to many of these and we're, uh, we welcome those uh, if, if it's been, if you're the first time, if it's the first time. If it is your first time, maybe put it in chat if this is your first time coming to one of our webinar series. Uh, very excited about uh, the, the speakers we've had. Really stoked about having Michael here. Michael's a longtime uh, veteran and thought leader in this space. We're excited to hear him. Mark will share a little bit more and Michael will tell more about him as well, but we're grateful, Michael, that could, you could be here. Um, and we, we're given the same message. The message right now is help one, hire one. What's that about? It's about helping those in our community who have been um, who have been impacted by the recent COVID crisis and are out of a job. Uh, that's making introductions. That's pointing them to a job direction, uh, job uh, posting. That's giving them advice on interviewing. Uh, whatever it may be, 
maybe it's just a, 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 a add a boy or add a girl any way that you can to give them encouragement, help them find a new job. And if you're in a position to hire, please hire um, and encourage. Uh, if you're in a position where you're thinking about laying off pe uh, people, please do uh, less. Uh, we're going to get through this together, but uh, this community is strong and we hope that we can rally around our friends and colleagues in the community and get them back to work and uh, doing the great things they've done. So. Thank you at Client Success. We're always here to help. Uh, we hope this is a help to you, but if we can help in any other ways, just send us an email or tweet or, or whatever. Reach out any way you can. We're, we're here to help this great customer success community. So thanks for having me. I'm gonna drop okay. off, let Mark and Michael do their thing and, and we'll see you on the next one as well. Thanks everyone. Right on, appreciate it. Thanks Dave. Thanks, Dave. And um, you know, curious, um, how much of the people who are on, how many of you are familiar with client success? Maybe you're a customer, maybe you're a user, evaluated us in the past, maybe been to one of our conferences like a CS100. Looks like, yeah, there's, a, there's quite a few folks that are familiar, which is good, evaluated in the past, you do the trainings, folks are just learning about it, so great. So, I mean, it looks like we've got a good mix of folks who are familiar and not, uh, for those of you, this is your first time or maybe not familiar, maybe would like to learn a little bit more. Um, to give you a little bit of context on who we are, we're a customer success growth platform. We help with all things related to customer success. So say your team needs help onboarding, driving adoption, renewals, growth, all of those are the types of things we help with. And the things that, you know, you know, a lot of people are reaching us out to, especially right now, to uh to get help with there's a lot of companies that are thinking about the idea if you remember kind of the series we did um last week with donna on operating under the mindset of you might have the customers you have right now might be the only customers you get this year so people are really you know throwing their arms around their customers reaching out to us seeing how they can help how we can help with that but it's been a while since you looked at us let me know we can have a chat we've had some really cool releases recently whether that's around NPS and feedback, whether that's around Slack integration, have a really cool revenue management platform coming right down the road that's, that's going to be a really big deal. So um, if you want to learn a little bit more, let us know. We're at clientsuccess.com or we are on Twitter at Client Success. Let me know. Give, give us a shout and we're happy to, happy to chat with you. So moving on to today. So thrilled to have Michael on. He and I were talking through different topics over the last few days. And when he brought up this idea of the crisis of confidence and customer success, it just, it just hit home. It seems so relevant right now. I think a lot of teams are having a quote unquote crisis of confidence with everything that's going on. And it just feels especially relevant to, to customer success. And, you know, it kind of felt like, you know, customer success really had arrived prior to this where we stopped having those conversations around the value of customer success or why you need to have a CS team. And then this pandemic hit and the economic wave we're living through. And it just feels like, you know, we're potentially might slip backward if we're not smart. So we need to figure out how do we, how do we overcome this and go forward and just really excited to have Michael come in and kind of share his thoughts through it. So Michael, let's, um, let's jump in. And just okay. so everybody knows, we'll, we'll manage it like usual. Uh, Michael has probably about, what would we say, 15, 20 minutes of content he'll share. We'll make it interactive. We'll make it a q and I'm man in the chat pane. And then we'll go through questions and like we always do. So Michael, where do you want to start? Terrific. Yeah, uh, I'll start. I'll just introduce myself and, um, and thank you, Mark, for that and for Dave for the opportunity to come on and uh, spend some time with with all you CS pros out there. Really appreciate it. Don't take this lightly. Um, really value your time. I thought about a virtual background today, um, but instead what I went with was a bookshelf behind me of books that I haven't read and um, glasses that are fake. So I, I'm going at it to try and, you know, make myself look a little bit smarter today. I need all the help I can get. Respect but, that. Respect that. <laughs> um, so that is a real background uh, with real books on it uh, that <laughs> I aspire to read one day. But I have the pleasure of leading a company called ESG. We do customer success as a service. It's an outsourced customer success option. We've got um, customer success centers in Denver and in Cincinnati, Ohio, 
and we have virtual customer success managers that that sit inside of those and i only mentioned that one if if you wanted to know what that was and second we're in a really interesting perch in the marketplace in terms of the things we get to see the businesses that we get to work with and the best practices that we get to share and i see a lot of really good things going on in the marketplace and i i see some you know repeated problems that are happening in the marketplace uh and and to mark's point when i, I thought about this message um this concept of the crisis of confidence is something that has been um ruminating in my mind for six or eight months now it's not a new thing i do think mm -hmm. it's increasingly relevant but it, it kind of started with me as I attended some, you know, field events, some some customer success trade shows and events, and and perhaps you've been to some of them as well. And there was one; it was a striking moment where I looked around, and it was super low energy. Um, eyes were drooping, shoulders were drooping, and I just thought, you know, these are really tough jobs because not only do we have to do our jobs with our customers, but there's a ton of internal justification for our own freaking existence that we have to do, right? Sure. And that is, that's just an uphill grind that it's not in every single other role inside of, of companies. And so my point of view on that is how you show up for that fight. First of all, recognizing that it's a fight. And second of all, determining your battle plan for how you show up for that fight is hugely critical in terms of the outcome of that scrap right and so um it, erica just said what you just said there was the most most truthful statement ever <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i just think you got to lean into it so i'm gonna i'm gonna yep. share with you how i do that and i i i'll tell you everyone um there are very tactical aspects of customer success roles. Like how do you do customer segmentation? How do you do onboarding? How do you do journey mapping? Those are really, really critical. That, that's not this, right? This is going to be super high level, philosophical. Hopefully you're challenged a little bit by it and it causes you to you know, re, uh, reinvestigate some of the critical beliefs that you have and how they apply um, in, in this setting. Um, I would just say there's a, there's a group of you that maybe this message is not for. And the message may not really be helpful if you have 100% of the headcount you need, if you have 100% support from your executive team, and if customer success fully exists at the heart of your revenue generating engine, then you, you may not get that much out of this, um, just to set expectations. My experience is what I just said applies to very few companies unfortunately yeah, right. and i think we're making some progress towards that goal but i did want to share with you a little bit about how i i think about that um one of the things i tell my team uh consistently and this has been a theme especially in the last 60 days as we've had to you know raise our level of visibility accountability um in the marketplace empathy all of it is that we've got to we've got to stay in the fight and we've got to play offense. And you're gonna see a couple of those themes through what I present here. And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. As Mark said, I, the, the length of what I have to say can be 10 minutes or can be two hours. And the only difference is the number of examples that I use. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use one example for each of the five elements of how to manage you and get through this crisis of confidence to do your best work in your responsibility as a customer success exec. And I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions. Happy to connect with any of you one-on-one -on -one afterwards if that's helpful as well and share more examples or to talk about your example uh, as well. Cool. So this is how I think of it. It's one slide, that's all I got today, my friends. Um, and if you, if you think about like, what are the five things that if you wanna show up supercharged, very confident, lean in, stay in the fight, all of the other things, like what are the five things that you have to get right? Here, here's how I think about it. Um, the first, and if you hear nothing else that I say today, um, hear this, that the most important head and shoulders of these five is mindset, right? And, and mindset meaning the frame of mind you choose for yourself when you walk into any situation based upon what is going on around you, right? And that's a super relevant one for today. Perhaps you have friends and family, and I had a call with my family not too long ago, and you know, one of my relatives was like, oh, this is the worst, and this is terrible, and this is, 
and I'm thinking, you know, you're, you're, you're staying at home for a few weeks with your family. And I don't know <laughs> if that's your mindset that this is the worst sure. and you're trapped in a prison, then it, it will impact your behavior. My foundational belief in terms of mindset is all based upon research. Okay. This isn't how you feel and how you think it, this is, the mindset that you choose will have a tremendous impact on the outcome of the situation, right? And that is a scientific fact that is documented in a book that if this is a topic that is near and dear to you, I would highly recommend. So it's written in 2006 by a Stanford professor named Carol Dweck. That's D-W-E-C-K. The book is appropriately called Mindset. It is a research book. Um, here are my key takeaways from that. Uh, there are two mindsets and many of you have seen this. Uh, if you need to see the, the graphic, go, uh, find me on LinkedIn. I actually just posted this graphic this morning. Um, there's a fixed mindset and there is a growth mindset. Those are the two mindsets, right? A fixed mindset says, um, problems are just that it's, it's something that I need to react to. It's due to the limitations of my skills and my capabilities and me as a person that's why i'm in this mess and i tend to stay stuck in the mess because my mindset is fixed that's one side the second side is a growth mindset and a growth mindset says every opportunity every scenario that i'm in is a chance to learn right and i'm gonna figure out and I'll bet you we could probably go on for two hours on the things that we've learned about ourselves in the last 30 days. It is a remarkable time, an unprecedented time in our lifetimes to explore your mindset and where are you applying fixed and growth. The other scenario here that um, was really important to me, and I'm, I'm summarizing a pretty long book in, in hopefully a few sentences, and I hope this helps, is that um, you do not have a predisposition of a mindset. It is a choice that you can make in every single situation, right? And so I may have a growth mindset in certain, certain circumstances and a fixed mindset in others. I actually think that's true in my life, right? And so the ability to recognize that and choose a growth mindset obviously will have a positive outcome for me. So it is a choice. Your choice is not the same in each situation. And, um, the research in the book is extremely compelling in terms of let's look at a group of people that has fixed mindset. Let's look at a group of people that has growth and let's compare their results, right? Cause of course it feels better to have a growth mindset, right? You're a little bit happier. You probably have a few more friends, but it goes way beyond that. Mm -hmm. And the statistical evidence is pretty overwhelming in that book in terms of performance, right? And right now in a challenging time when we're under siege a little bit, Right? Having a growth mindset and looking at this as an opportunity to sharpen my knife, an opportunity to get better, an opportunity to you know, show up with, with confidence and to learn from every single situation that I'm in so that I can be the best version of me, a better version of me when we all you know, exit our home offices and are, are able to uh, see each other again is a very noble pursuit. And I would uh, strongly encourage you to take a look at um, your mindset, examine it across a fixed and growth plane. And again, take a look at my LinkedIn. There is a one page summary graphic there. Or if you're really into this topic, get the book by Professor Dweck. Um, you will not regret spending some time in that. I just posted the link in the chat panel and it looks like we've already sold two books. So uh, she, <laughs> she, she owes you some, she owes you an affiliate payment. That's right. That's right. Uh, my growth mindset expects a kickback. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, the next one. Um, and again, these are really deep topics. I'm, I'm touching the top of the ways we could, we could go on for the rest of the day about mindset and how we make those decisions. I love that topic. I love human psychology. The last 30 days, a fascinating um, example of, of human psychology. So hopefully that, that part helps. Um, the second is with regards to your strengths and the importance in this context of knowing what you're good at and what you're not good at, right? Let me give you uh, uh, one quick example from my life. I've coached a lot of, of youth basketball um, in my life here. Uh, I live in Denver, Colorado, and so we're, we're on the sideline waiting to start a game. 
uh, it was eighth grade boys team I was coaching and there was a, a, a kid on my team. His name was Cody. And I pulled him over and I said, Hey, um, how are you going to help us win this game today? Right. And with today's generation like that of, of kids, that is like a really foreign question. Right. It's like, how many touches am I going to get? And how many points am I going to score? It's like, no, how are you going to help us win? Very valid question for customer success executives. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so he didn't know how to answer that. You know, the kid's 14. So I, I primed him a little bit. I said, are you going to score 25 points today? No, probably not. Okay. Do we need you to? No. Okay. Could you, could you spend 10 minutes today guarding the best player on the other team? Could you get three rebounds and could you get two loose balls? Right? So if you prevent that kid right there and I'm pointing to their best player, from scoring, make his life a little bit more difficult. You get a few rebounds, you get a couple of loose balls. Our chance of winning just went from 50% to 70%. And that is really, really important, right? To know your strengths. And I would just apply that same concept inside of each of our companies, right? Really important now to know your strengths. If any of you have got three ways to do this, um, two I recommend and one uh, enter at your own risk. So the best one is, if any of you have been through an exercise like this, a strength, strength based leadership, let me try that one more time. Strengths based leadership. I turned it into a three syllable word. <laughs> that five um, <laughs> uh, written by Don Clifton. It's a Gallup poll. And so I, I went and found this. Um, and then these are my notes from the session that I took a few years ago where you, you identify your strengths and then you build a plan to go through the strengths and I'll just hit you with mine in summary. Um, and so I, I dusted this off and I'm revisiting this right on the edges of the day where you've got a little more time. My strengths are responsibility, activator, maximizer, relator, and strategic. Okay. So that's the toss salad that makes me up. Um, but the point is there are tools out there that, enable you to really understand your strengths and to make sure you're doing more and more and more of that because we're going to talk about value in a second but your your strengths really um are the foundation of being able to perform your value so if you have something like this and perhaps if you've gone through an exercise like this in your past and you can find it spend a few minutes with it it's a really fascinating review to understand um you know, how you, how you come out in a, a very research-based uh, study and just to refresh yourself on, am I, am I utilizing my strengths in my current role? And are there ways that I can utilize them a little bit more? That's, that, if you have something like that, that's probably the first and best way. The second, which is a little, uh, a little less formal, is take a look at the last 30 days and write down the, like, if you had six things that you really, really like to do, what were the six most enjoyable things? Could be business, could be in your life. Like write your six headlines from the last 30 days and then search for commonalities, right? What do, what do those six have in common? They're probably going to lead you to a less formal place, um, but you're going to get your strengths out of that exercise as well as you go through and look at the things that you really enjoy doing. It will lead you to the things you're passionate about and that passion and that confidence comes through in everything you do. The third and most riskiest way to uh, understand your strengths is to uh, ask someone, like, what do you think I'm, I'm good at? Um, it could be a friend. It could be a mentor. Uh, it could be a spouse. Um, it could be someone, you know, that you're, you're currently um, in confinement with. So I would just caution you that, you know, handle that conversation with kid gloves because you're probably going to be in the same house with this person hundred percent of the time for um, another couple of weeks, depending on where you live. So in terms of strengths, those are the three things I would think about um, really important that you understand them and that you're activating them every single day. If you've got a formal exercise, hit that. If you can write down the six things that you really, really enjoy doing over the last 30 days, or have a conversation with someone on what your strengths are. I think those are really good places to start. What are your thoughts on, so sometimes you hear this discussion around focus on your strengths, fix your, fix your weaknesses, 
you know, I always kind of see different kind of sides of that argument. Some people say you got to yep. fix your weaknesses. Some people you say you just got to double, triple, quadruple down on your strengths. Where do you kind of settle on that? What are your thoughts? Yeah, it's been a conflict inside of me too, Mark. It's a good question. Um, I, the coaches that I've worked with um, have, have guided me. My, my initial bias was I'm a gap closer. Right. I, I've mentioned, I mean, I've, I've got an athletic background. I got a basketball background and my workouts were all, what am I not good at? What did the last yeah. game teach me that I needed to work on? And then I would just go kill that with reps in the gym the next mm -hmm. day. I mean, if I missed a couple free throws at the end of a game, the, the next 48 hours, I shot 5,000 of them, like things like that. So that was the yeah, bias Kobe Bryant I brought mentality. in. Yeah, I, I brought that bias into the business world and, and I found that it, it wasn't that effective. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, uh, and so I've been guided much more towards um, finding roles where your strengths are allowed to flourish and, you know, your gaps are potentially minimized. So I don't ignore my gaps uh, completely, but I try to be in a role where that's not thrown in my face every single day. Mm -hmm. um, by and large, my strengths are allowed to flourish. And then the other way I think about it in a team context is hiring people who um, close your gaps. My team at ESG is remarkable with this. I mean, you go ask any of them. They can, uh, they can pinpoint my blind spots like that. Um, and we've just developed a relationship where if we're going to go do something and going to do something involves me having to activate something I'm not good at, they just step up and fill in those gaps. And, and that's been super rewarding to uh, build a team that uh, is capable of doing that. Nice. Yeah. Cool. That's great. Yep. Okay. So value is next. Um, I feel like I keep telling you each of these is really important. I will continue to say mindset is the most, but value um, and a lot of these words, I think it's important to define. So value really is your, your reputation and I would encourage each of you to know your personal value and know the value of your organization inside of your company. And even if it's small, define it, right? Organizations run on feelings and well, I mean, we're talking to customers and we're being proactive and not going to cut it, right? Not going to cut it. And so if it's, even if we're proactively talking to customers to be able to, um, catalog the feedback and put it in categories and now your value is i'm the person that's talking to customers every day and i've got it organized and i've got the feedback categories and i'm sharing that with product and i'm doing all of the things that you can do with that data start small if we go to any of these large like you know tsa type conferences and 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 you walk into the big ballroom and i don't know if any of you ever get overwhelmed by like the here are the customer success kpis mm -hmm. right and there's you know a lot of them and i think I can measure like one of them kind of, and it almost is a little bit demoralizing sometimes um, depending on the state of, of your business. Start somewhere. You don't have to get to 28 KPIs, but make sure it's more than zero and that you're able to quantify your value um, in some way. Um, the second element of this, and this is, this is just, I can't overstate um, the importance of this. If you don't believe right now in today's marketplace with every fiber of your being that the future of your company depends on the success of the customer success organization, you won't make it, right? That's an interesting exercise to go through in and of itself as well, right? Do I believe I am right? Am I convicted that if without us, Everything is a subscription. Everything's month to month. There's no long-term contracts. We are the defenders of the freaking revenue, right? And if that is the conviction I have, and I have 100% certainty in that, that should bleed into everything that I do. Every text I send, every email I reply to, every conversation I have, every quarterly business review I do, every time I interact with the executives of the company to say, this is what my team did, right? is that ethos shining through, right? And it's okay if you're in a situation where I don't know if I can say that's true. I don't know if I believe with 100% certainty that this company would literally just fall down without customer success, right? So if you don't, 
that's a really good exercise to go through as well. Let's say 80% believe it. Well, what's the 20% of why you don't? It could be a, a dissenting um, executive, right? It could be the fact that you just went through an exercise where you thought you were super critical, but your team got cut from 12 to nine. And that sends a whole different message, right? But it's time to get back up on the horse and get back in front of people and demonstrate that value over and over again. And I assure you, having sat through these meetings as the recipient of this information, if you don't believe it with 100% every fiber of your being, nobody else will. Nobody else will. There's not a chance you'll get more headcount. There's not a chance that you'll get money for you know, systems that you need like client success. You're, you're, you're not going to get what you need. You're going to get stuck in the mud um, and, and live in life on a treadmill. You have to believe it. And if you don't, reach out to someone, have that conversation, and, and, and get up on the horse. You got to stay in that fight. So that, that's my, my thinking on value. So, so what if I totally, I'm totally bought in, I get you, I, I feel it, I, I, I'm with you, but I know that my boss doesn't agree with that. You know, my boss is boss, you know, last, you know, when we were talking on Tuesday, we were talking about management and, you know, we talked to a bunch of CS folks who are reporting into folks who just maybe don't even get customer success fundamentally. Right. Like we've seen, we've seen team shift, we've seen customer success leaders get laid off. And now they're reporting into, let's say, a sales leader or a CRO who's more of a sales leader who just doesn't get customer success. What? Maybe you can't kind of give me the whole playbook, but like, what's the first couple steps you yeah. advise me to take if I'm in that organization? Yeah, I, I mean, the first level of assessment, and this one's kind of obvious, is is if that is the conviction of the organization, there's a chance you're in the wrong organization, right? So, but let's assume okay. that's not the case. Let's take that off the table and say that, you know, we're going to try and make this work. I think it goes back to the other elements that we've, we've talked about. What is, what is your mindset? How do you react to that situation? Okay. So let's take the things you said, Mark, they don't know anything about customer success. Huh? Do you? So if you do, right, put your strengths to work, right? Mm -hmm have the mindset that this is a growth opportunity. And if they are ignorant about a topic and I am informed about a topic, how, how do you fashion that into an advantage for yourself so that you can, you know, begin to get people, <coughs> excuse me, on your side. Okay. And then in terms, in terms of value, I would, you know, it, it's little battles. Um, in a scenario like you're describing, you're probably not going to, you know, go to a board meeting and win a war one time, right? It's little tiny battles and you got to assess your environment and say, well, that person kind of gets it. Yeah. What is it going to take to get them a hundred percent in my camp? Right. And how do I get them a hundred percent of the fiber of their being believing in what sure. we're doing? And then you just begin to aggregate from there. The frustrating, but reality, but, but the real thing is, yeah, you're, I'm not going to go in and have, someone's going to have a revelation and all of a sudden change their mind. It's, I got to play the long game here. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm tactically saying, maybe I get my manager, then I get another executive, then I get, and maybe I don't even get them hundred percent of the way there. I get them 50, 60, 70% of the way there. And over time, then you start to see the culture of the, the organization change. Yep. So yeah, cool. And I, I, I would tell you, my friends, and I say this with a tremendous amount of respect and sincerity, sincerity, and I say this to my own company all the time. We have chosen uphill jobs. We have. There are downhill jobs. There are flat jobs, right? We have chosen uphill jobs, right? And they are uphill jobs that you can't take longer to get to the top of the hill because it's uphill. You actually have to get there at the same rate of everyone that's flat. You just have an incline. Right. And so you got to sprint up the freaking hill. And I think acknowledging that that's, that's where we are as an industry right now and accepting that challenge as a tremendous opportunity for you as a person and as a professional is part of the reward. Cool. Yep. Um, all right. So next we have growth. Um, a couple things about, about growth. Um, it ties back to, to strengths. It's kind of a bit of the antithesis of, of strengths, but, um, growth meaning um, make sure that you are you know following some type of a framework to grow as a person and as a professional and make sure that you've thought that out and it's intentional and so that would mean things like who you surround yourself with 
what you read, who you spend time with, who you listen to, whose advice you take and whose you reject. Um, I think as you begin to execute some of the things that we're talking about, the first thing that will grow is your confidence, right? And so if your confidence is dragging a little bit right now at this point in time in this profession, that's gotta be your focus to grow. Let's get that confidence up. Um, the second area that follows behind that, and we all probably could go on for a long time about stories of this, is you gotta grow the thickness of your skin, right? There's, there's naysayers in our world, right? There aren't naysayers that you know, question whether we need sales. There are very few naysayers that question whether we need marketing. There are naysayers out there that actively question whether they need customer success, right? And so being able to um, step away from that from a personal standpoint and accepting that as a business challenge and growing a thick skin so that you stay in the fight and bounce back, really, really critical. I mean, I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir on this one, but being a business leader is hard. It's really hard. You got to do hard things every single day. And um, I think the biggest obstacle to success that I've seen in our industry is just simply a lack of optimism, right? And I know that sounds hokey and it sounds like a t-shirt or a Hallmark card, but I, I've interacted with enough professionals at enough events just to know that <sighs> there's too much Eeyore out there. Um, oh, well, I don't have the headcount I need. I don't have the budget I need and it's not cut enough. And many of you, to be fair and respectful, have every reason to think that way, right? But I know it's hard and a lack of optimism in how you're gonna get out of that, 100% holding you back um, and you just gotta break through that. Um, I think in this environment, and again, this, this sounds, this is gonna be the hokiest thing I say all day. Um, the true ROI in this environment is happiness. Like happiness is the true ROI um, in growing, right? Because you'll see that growth. You're able to handle things that you weren't able to before. You're able to have conversations with people that would have freaked you out before. You're able to make presentations, you know, and, and really have a conviction that you weren't able to do before. Those are the fruits of your growth that will, you know, drive up um, happiness, which is really the ROI there. So those are my thoughts on growth. Okay, great. Um, finally, uh, and this will probably be the shortest section, but I would end with, with learning. I, and, and again, this one is, is really important. I can't emphasize this one enough either. Um, but I would, I would argue that your biggest advantage and your biggest opportunity right now is to accelerate your learning. Accelerate your learning is your biggest opportunity that you have right now. Um, and that includes things like having the audacity to listen, right? Um, come and do a webinar like this and paying attention and taking notes and taking action. Um, spending time with your mentors and your coaches. Um, diving into customer success forums online and taking advantage of some of the great resources that uh, are available on all of our respective websites. Um, but really accelerating learning, not just learning because it's hard to go through a day and not learn, but having a plan to purposefully and intentionally accelerate your learning. Um, I would say the one of the things that I'm working on um, in this period, I, I mentioned the strengths-based leadership that I'm reviewing that, um, but that is a review. It's something that I've gone through before. This is a new one, um, is a book called Applied Empathy. Um, this book is written by a gentleman named Michael Ventura, and it, it this there's a lot of concepts that get thrown around in our world that sometimes we know what they mean, sometimes they don't, they're misused. Um, and so I wanted to dig in on this one because empathy is a, a hot word right now. It's kind of a buzzword right now. And so sure. I wanted to find out for myself if it, if it means anything or is it garbage? Um, because I'm, I got plenty in my head. I'm happy to discard the, the garbage stuff, but I found like if you really dig in on a topic like empathy, and I would define empathy simplistically as the ability to see something through the eyes of someone else, easy to say, really, really hard to do. Um, and this book digs into how to do that and why it's important. 
And again, if we're in this battle and I'm encouraging you to stay in the fight, right? The, the, the inclination may be, and this is why I kind of put this, this thought at the end, the inclina inclination may be when you're in the, the thick of the battle that I'm listening to someone, but I am forming my response while they're talking, right? Because it's kind of a debate setting. I mean, sometimes you got to do that, right? But if that's your default mode, then you're not demonstrating empathy. You're not actively listening, like all of those types of things where you really need to understand, like for someone who doesn't believe in the purpose of customer success, that, that's really important that you understand that through their lens. Like, why do they think that? And how do you get under that? And how do you ask the right questions to get the information out of them to, you know, make sure that you're able to execute your game plan um, and, uh, make sure that your team stays engaged with your customer base. So I, I would, I would end it there. And I would just, again, I would just exhort all of you like now is not the time um, to shrink. Like now is the time to, to rise up. Um, now is the time to understand your strengths. Now is the time to make sure you have a growth mindset and that you're, you're investing in yourself. Now is the time to have the conviction with everything in your body, a hundred percent that, your company needs you and your team to succeed in the future. Um, and I hope that helps. No, that's awesome. Really good. Um, and yeah, like you said at the beginning, much more of a philosophical discussion, but I know for me, like it's got me thinking a lot about a lot of stuff. I just, even this learning piece at the very end, I was, you know, listening to something the other day and it was talking about, you know, how, a bunch of leaders out there said something how like Warren Buffett will read 500 pages a day, right? That guy's just a learning machine. And mm -hmm. part of the reason he's been able to be so successful is just, he's just a little bit smarter every day when he goes to bed than when he wakes up. And I think if we can yep. apply that, you know, that's, that's, that's spot on. A um, yep. few questions here. Um, so back to your, back to your point on, you said you're, you're mentioning some stuff about customer happiness and, you know, there's a question here that says, what tips do you have to track either customer happiness or referenceability, you know, have any thoughts or question or any thoughts or tips on, on that question? Yeah. Um, so I see, as I, as I started out with, like we, we manage a bunch of different client engagements. So I get a chance to see how a variety of, of companies are solving this. Mm -hmm. um, my personal point of view is that net promoter score is a diluted um, panacea for all things customer happiness. I mean, it's worth is greater than zero. Don't get me wrong, but it is, it is significantly overrated. And I think it's overrated for some of the reasons that we talked about. Um, it is something that, the um, executive level at your company can understand, right? Mm -hmm. sure. So um, there's value in it in that regard. A single member, I, it moves up or down and, you know, yeah. I, I can track it. It's been b built into all the training and coaching that they've received that, uh, you know, what's your NPS? Well, my NPS is this, but it's kind of like a golf handicap, right? So mm -hmm. anyways, th there's value in that. And if you can use NPS to, you know, advance your cause with your executive team, do that. I think much more meaningful in terms of understanding each um, customer in terms of their happiness. Customers vote, <coughs> excuse me, in two ways. They vote with usage and consumption, that's one, right? And they vote with their dollars, right? So I would focus on those two things. How much of your um, service or product is the end user consuming and is that going up or down and of the full capability of adoption like where are they on that curve and do they buy more and do they renew over time like those are those are the two and, and then of course in your role what are you doing during that journey mm -hmm. to impact that to a positive outcome but that's the way i think about it cool very good um getting a few questions here kind of leaning into the the growth mindset the learning um you know, what, what, what advice would you have for somebody who wants to learn more specifically about customer success? Are there specific forums? Are there specific books? Are there people you'd follow? Twitter, mm -hmm. LinkedIn? Are there, you know, 
mentors you'd reach out you, you'd maybe that have been impactful for you just like how would you get to somebody who's especially new in the profession and they're sitting here saying got a big opportunity to learn in this new this new industry this new market yep but i don't even know where to start if i start in sales it's pretty obvious there's a pretty well-worn path of how do i learn about sales how am i learning about customer success yeah no it's a great question um i, I like to zoom out on those things because i think the the risk is to um dive deep into the weeds of something that i really don't fully understand right so one recommendation that i have that would accomplish that um some of you may have read this book i, I recently did is subscribed um by the founder of zora right yeah. because i think it's important to understand the macroeconomic forces that lead to the necessity of customer success right in the absence of um, the subscription economy eating everything, right? Customer success may be, I would argue, still necessary, but certainly less necessary, right? So understanding what's happening in the macroeconomic environment, how that applies to your company, how that applies to your department, how that applies to your role, those are the stair steps down that I would take. So that's, that's, that's one thing. The second is um, there are forums uh, on LinkedIn that I would absolutely get connected to um, consuming content. But I, I also think, especially for people just starting in customer success, what you will find is that this is an extremely responsive, extremely helpful community. I would encourage you to publish things on LinkedIn. And you may be looking at that going, oh, well, why would I do that? I don't even know what the heck I'm doing, right? Mm -hmm. So documenting your journey in a way that might help other people. I'll give you one example. Let's say you're a new CSM and you don't know what you're doing. Like, hey, here's my diary from today. I thought I would share it and see if anyone has any thoughts on it. You know, here are the three things that worked out really, really well for me. I was asked to do these two things, had no idea how to do it. And here's how I reacted. Any thoughts or input? Right. And just that type of engagement. I mean, I think we think of this from a consumption standpoint exclusively, Mark. I would encourage you to flip that around. And what does publishing look like to you? Because it's a different way of engaging with a super engaged community. And I think you will be extremely pleased and impressed with the level of reaction that you get. Some of my favorite posts are not, here's something that I do. Here, it's more, here's a question that I have. One of, the, one of the posts that I saw the other day was, you know, here's the ideal for a certain situation. Let's say I'm going to run a daily huddle or a one-on-one -on -one or a call with a customer. I know what the, I know what, you know, people say I should do. Here's what really happened. Mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts? What are your advice on that? So, I mean, that's, um, there, there's a bunch of different ways to get, to get active on that, which is, uh, which is really good. Yeah. Um, it's funny, you, you, you see some of the comments here. We've got some folks who are saying this is like CSM therapy for them. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see here. Let me, there's a few more questions here. We just got a few more in here. Let me see here. Um, you know, Michael, well stated about understanding empathy and applying it. Um, another comment about this being CSM therapy. Um, the Daryl says, I'm new to the field. Um, just got hired. Let's see. I'm new to this field. and got hired for my people skills. Um, but I was a teacher for 13 and a half years. So daily, I'm trying to figure this out. So interesting to see people from, you know, different markets, teachers coming into to customer success. Um, one of the, one of, you know, my friends in customer success, who's been in it for a while, actually, Julie, who's going to be our, our guest a week from now, something she always shares with me is, when she's building a customer success team, she actually looks for people that have come from hospitality. She'll go try to recruit CSMs from, you know, that, that audience. Cause you know, it's uh, you know, a lot of the same mindset. Um, Bob asked a question here. Can, can you comment on what you've seen over the past month on this increase in crisis and crisis of confidence? Do you feel mm -hmm. CSM teams are, are failing in justifying their value? Or are executives trimming the wrong people based on their ignorance and lack of understanding of the value of customer success? And the other day we had a comment where somebody's like, look, I'm seeing people trim off their CS teams, but they're keeping their new business teams. 
or right. you know what are what are your thoughts especially over what you've seen in the last month yeah it's been pretty dramatic um and a little bit discouraging right so we think about when when we talk to a client of ours we think about customer success in the context of maturity right and we all have a like to your point mark we all have an ideal of how we would like things done and we are at some point in the journey less than that ideal um, we like to document like what is the maturity stair step look like in terms of phases and what are your what happens to your capabilities as you advance through um, that maturity model um, I mentioned that because I I think as an industry we have matured but relative to other organizations we're, we're still relatively immature so while our maturity as a profession is ahead of where it was 12 months ago, it's still a little um, unstable in terms of its impact to the bottom line of a business. I think every company that has had to face this crisis and has reacted to it by eliminating customer success resources, one of two things has happened. One, they've made a ton of bad decisions over the last decade. <laughs> and this is an exposing event and yeah. now it's time to, to to pay the piper and it probably impacts a bunch of divisions but um i just think setting the entire company up wrong has been exposed in example after example um the second reason would be there is not a clear connection to um the revenue and protecting the revenue i i, I mean we've all heard the 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 sports analogy that defense wins championships that is has been a I, I think that's been true proven true over and over and over again and in that environment these companies are trying to win championships and we are the freaking defenders of the revenue right i would argue at a time like this you need more customer success resources because your existing base of customers is more important now because your ability to sell has been inhibited for the next year Right. I mean, who hasn't turned down their sales forecast for the next 12 months? Probably every company has. Right. And I would argue that on your balance sheet, then the priority has now just shifted to your existing customer base. Right. And so if what I just said, I know everyone in this call believes in that and it seems kind of obvious. But for companies that are in the midst of this and laying off customer success people, that connection has not been made. But I think that's an opportunity for all of us to help make it. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, dead on. Um, so there's a comment I was going to make, but we're getting close on time. So I'm actually going to read one more, one or two more of these questions. Okay. Um, so Roxy asks, um, can you comment on the difference between just customer service versus actual customer success? I feel like sometimes I'm getting caught up in trying to make a customer happy and end up sounding like I work at Chick-fil-A versus identifying what success would look like. Um, yeah. What do you thought? I know there's a lot of roles that live in kind of that hybrid world. Um, I mean, as you've probably figured out, I have definitive opinions on quite a few things and uh, some of them are actually right. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not all of them, but in this world, like I view customer success and customer service as polar opposites. Okay. Um, they both have the word customer in them and the second word both start with an S. And I, 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 it's inexplicable to me how they get confused organizationally because one is reactive, customer service is reactive, initiated by a customer and the person receiving the call is largely uninformed. The second customer success is it's proactive, initiated by me and I'm calling with information and with a purpose. Those are two fundamentally opposite. But I also understand to, to Roxy's question, sometimes you're in a world where, yeah, great, that separation sounds really good when you're flapping your gums on a webinar, but what do I do when I'm in the seat and, and that happens? Um, I, the only thing that I, I, I would encourage you to do is we, we try to have um, what we call I noticed conversations with our customers and users, right? So we're, we're the CSM team for our customers. And so that requires a level of um, information and of data. Um, and I'm calling you up and I'm saying, hey, Mark, I noticed that but, but, but something happened, 
right? First off, the conversation, just the words that you're choosing to use. Um, you're communicating that you've taken the time to notice something in the B2B world. Like a lot of companies don't notice anything that's happening. Mm -hmm. sure. So you're, 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 you're scoring some points right out of the gate, but then, Hey, I noticed that this was happening and had a question about that. And that I think the more Roxy you can make, I notice calls versus um, receiving calls and having to react to them. Um, and if you don't have that information in that data to place those informed calls, that's something to press on internally at your company because it will make a world of difference night and day. Cool. Really good. Um, let's, let's wrap there. And Michael, um, this has been awesome. Been super helpful. I've taken a ton of notes. Hopefully everybody else has taken a ton of notes judging by the amount of comments we've gotten about how helpful, how therapeutic this has been. This has been great. Um, I'm, uh, well, any any last words, any call to action that you want anyone to take to engage with you in some way? You know, we, we, we posted a few book links so that we, we, we've yeah. got books people are going to download. Um, what's your what's your call to action final message to everybody on the call? Yeah, I, I would just encourage each of you to lean into this and view it as a, as a scrap and, and engage fully. Um, it's going to take everything that you have. And that's when you do your best work. I, it is. Um, secondly, I try to live what I talk. I don't always do it perfectly, but I, I try. So I would encourage you to engage with me. Find me on LinkedIn. Send me questions. Um, I'm happy to uh, pay attention to the stuff that I, I post on LinkedIn. Most of the things I post on LinkedIn are some flavor of the topics that we're talking about here, an article that I came across, right? And so I'll continue to share there. Um, I will continue to engage with your content, but um, hold me accountable to, you know, a level of responsiveness to the community because, you know, I take that responsibility very seriously. We, we got this. This is a speed bump, not a cliff, right? And a speed bump is going to cause you to jolt forward, maintain control of the car, and keep moving down the dang road, right? A cliff causes you to go over it, crash, and die. Two very different things, right? So this is a speed bump. We're going to get through it, but we're going to get through it to the extent that we rely on each other. Awesome. Really good. Really appreciate it. Great words. Um, and just for everybody else, hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to post the recording, hopefully this afternoon. If not, first thing in the morning, I'll shoot out a note um, so you all can go back and review it, share it with your colleagues, share it with anybody that you think would find value in this. Um, and also, again, if you haven't yet, please take a minute, fill out the feedback form that I put in the chat pane. I'll send in the follow-up email also. Um, and you know, th thanks again to Michael. This was fantastic and hope, hope you and your family stay safe. Yeah. Thanks Mark. Appreciate it. Last thing I would say is do something today. Tomorrow's too late. Do something Agreed. today that you heard here, put it into action and enjoy the benefits. Awesome. Well, cool. Thanks everybody. Thanks Michael. See you everyone. Thank you. See you guys.